Good morning. It's Wednesday morning, and I am so pleased to be able to come to talk with you and share with you the Word of God today. It is past the long weekends where both Canada celebrated its Canada Day last week and the Americans have celebrated their 4th of July. And now we're into these, I'm not sure if it's dog days of summer or certainly the hot days of summer. And I hope you are keeping cool and you are thinking, I know about the needs of other people at this time because of everything from the coronavirus right through to the needs of your own family and friends who are scattered and sometimes you're unable to be with them. So we're going to begin with the Word of God and I'm going to share some thoughts with you today about serving because this is a wonderful lesson today from John's Gospel about Jesus washing the feet of those that he loved. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts its knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens, and runs about it to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. O God, the source of all life, you fill the earth with beauty. Open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. For the sake of him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Malachi. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations, and in every place incense shall be offered to my name, and pure offerings, for my name shall be great among the nations says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. 
Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in the lesson today, you shall wash on one another's feet. I have set an example for you. I have set an example for you. CNN is something that I watch once in a while to catch up on the news and see what's happening in the world. It doesn't always give me the breadth of news that the CBC does or the BBC, but it does give you a glimpse into what's happening south of the border. I watched a program the other day where two pastors were talking about a new movement that they have started with other people to bring about perhaps the rejuvenation of part of the Christian church in the United States. Uh, one was an African-American pastor, and he represented a uh, denomination, I think, that was uh, one of the American Episcopal uh, Methodist churches. And there was another gentleman who was a pastor of a, a church in North Carolina. I listened to both of them for a while. I, they didn't really identify what church they were involved in, but both of them were men who were quite concerned about where Christianity is heading in the United States. The person on CNN who was interviewing them was talking to them about why the church has not been involved more often with the poor, the struggling, the needy, and in recent days, of course, with the Black Lives Matter and the protests going on across the United States. And that was why the two men, one, one black and one white, were saying, it is time for us to come together. And we are bringing together nearly two million people from various congregations in the United States to talk about the gospel and what Jesus is calling us to do. It became an animated discussion because at one point, the person asking the question said, well, it seems that all these mega churches don't seem to be too concerned about the uh, poor and the needy, uh, whereas uh, you seem to feel that that's the gospel lesson. And uh, both of the gentlemen said, well, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ to look after the poor and the struggling and the needy and those who are ill and those who are discriminated against. And they said people who are not doing that are probably not Christians. I thought to myself, that's a pretty harsh uh, determination. And it is a determination that we don't make lightly. We sort of don't criticize other churches very often. And if we do, we try to do it respectfully. So I was a little bit awed by that because my wife has said in the past, if churches aren't doing something to help, those who are struggling, then why are we here? And these two men made it clear that Christianity has a responsibility to do, to share. Jesus makes it clear. He washes the feet of his disciples, and he says, I've set an example for you, something for you to do. I've set an example of what it is to humble yourself and to be a servant of all, not to be served, but to serve. I think that's a quite difficult call because it's much easier to sell Christianity as something that you can get and have and can enjoy. Uh, I did a funeral the other day for a gentleman who uh, his daughter said felt he knew the Lord and that he'd come to Jesus and he tried to preach to his family constantly about coming to Jesus. I know that uh, I was part of that as both a Baptist and a Pentecostal when I was younger, but I also know that there's, there's a self-serving part to Christianity which we have to avoid, and that is saying, I'm better than you. Service to others is what really Jesus is talking about today. I wash the feet of you. Now it's up to you to serve others. Serving or self-serving? How do we define it? I do love mysteries, and one of the mysteries that I have embraced over the years is written by Ellis Peters. She was an English mystery writer. She wrote about mysteries in the Middle Ages, particularly around Shrewsbury, which is near the in England near the Welsh border. She wrote a series with her hero, um, Brother Cadfile, and you can find some of the films were made by the BBC of some of those books. 
But Brother Cadfa was an interesting character because he was not only a monk, a Benedictine monk, but he was also a healer. He raised all kinds of things in his garden to help heal people of their wounds and their problems. And in so he also solved mysteries. It reminded me that the church at its best created hospitals, created libraries, created universities. The church was not self-serving, it was missionary. Now we have fallen into difficult times often again and again. When we become wealthy and powerful, the church has time and again tended to serve itself. It has exercised power over other people. We've seen it in recent days with some of the conviction of clergy who have abused children. We've seen it also in some of the televangelists who wouldn't allow their churches to be opened when flooding was in Texas. We've seen it time and again when we read about pastors who have airplanes and yachts and big game mansions and all of those different things, because somehow they've turned this idea of what it is to be Christian is it is to be self-serving and to get and have that Jesus wants you to be prosperous. It's a prosperity gospel that is being sold. And to many people in North America, they like that. They enjoy that. But the church was a servant church, and it doesn't handle power very well. If the church was a church in the Middle Ages and at different times that has done good things for people. I remember several Anglicans, particularly in my own tradition, that I remind myself were incredible people. William Wilberforce was part of a Anglican group in London who not only did two things that were incredibly important. One was brought about the end of slavery throughout the British Empire. That was an incredible gift that he gave. He also began humane societies because he saw animals mistreated all the time. There's Florence Nightingale, who went to Crimea to help those who were suffering and dying, not from war in the Crimea, where the Britain was fighting against the Russians, but disease that was running rampant among all of those wounded men. I'm reminded of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, an Episcopalian, and his wife, Eleanor. Franklin Roosevelt came to power during the Great Depression, and he brought back a sense of prosperity to the United States. And Eleanor Roosevelt was very concerned about African-American people and began projects to help them and work with them to bring about a change in society, which came about in the 1960s with some of the first civil rights legislations. It's important to remember that we, the church, have a great responsibility, and that responsibility can't be given up for ourselves. Self-service is a very dangerous, dangerous path to take, and it puts us in a power situation that's not tenable, and it shouldn't be. We keep bouncing back to Jesus to serve others, and that's not self-aggrandizement. That's what it is to wash the feet. Remember about washing feet. I want to remind you that today we consider our, these things, these hands of ours, as being very dirty. We wash our hands constantly during this pandemic particularly. But in the biblical days, people often either were, either were walking barefoot or walking in sandals. They had to walk through just about everything. And streets were not pleasant places to be where people dumped their sewage and garbage and everything else. So the feet were considered extremely dirty. And when you came to someone's house as a guest, usually a slave or a person who was indentured servant helped wash your feet as a symbol of their servitude to you. So Jesus says, I'm going to wash your feet, you, my disciples. Now you have to take that dirty job on, and you're going to have to wash the feet of others. You're going to have to do something very important. The question came up this morning when I was watching uh, some of the news and listening on my radio about why is it the Americans have had such a time, a hard time, with the coronavirus, where other countries have done so well. For instance, New Zealand. Uh, for instance, many European countries, and for instance, even Canada, where we have brought down the number of cases to nearly a flat curve. We flattened the curve, as they say. We brought it down to a manageable size. That's not to say there couldn't be outbreaks again. Australia counted today in, in Melbourne that there was another outbreak. However, we've done pretty well. 
And part of that comes from a sense of who we are, who we are as Europeans, and perhaps who we are as part of the Commonwealth of Nations. And that is to help take responsibility together, share it, and say we all have to be part of this. Why do the Americans have such a tough time? Because the American Constitution always employs certain rights, freedoms. You have a right to do whatever you want. You have a right to somehow do whatever you'd like to do. And so people put up a protest about having to wear a mask or they protest at having to distance themselves from others. And yet you're doing it not for yourself, but for those around you. You're serving others by wearing a mask. You're helping other people not catch a coronavirus. And that's important. But the United States is too often, and I am partly American, too often been built on this sense of I can do what I want and you can't stop me from doing what I want. You can't make, legislate for me that I have to wear a mask. You can't do something that I don't want you to do. Well, that kind of personal freedom, that kind of irresponsibility is feeding and fueling the fire of the coronavirus down south of the border. Until people recognize they have to share in this responsibility, that won't, it won't end, it won't stop. You and I have recognized here in Canada that we have a shared responsibility for each other. I'm not saying we're perfect, we are far from it, but we are people who are learning along the way that we are responsible for each other. The question comes along, why has the church allowed itself, I gather, to become, in a sense, move so far from this idea of service to what I would call survival? Survival is what we've been in for probably the last 100 years. We may think that it was only in the last, say, 60 years or 70 years, the post-war churches were full. But they were full of people after World War I and World War II, of people who simply felt it was the important, normal thing to do, to go to church on Sunday. I'm not sure they realized why they were there as much as their neighbors did and so they did. We're beginning to realize today that the church is something different than what we thought. Hundreds of churches are being closed down across the United States and Canada. It's because people are not attending. And elderly people who are still part of churches are saying, we don't have any young people. What's happening to the young people? And the answer is, we forgot who we were. We forgot who we were along the way. And the lesson today reminds us of that. Jesus says, I'm calling you to wash each other's feet, to care for each other, to serve each other. We just, we just somehow got wrapped up in the idea of survival. And we didn't realize the church is not about survival. It's about mission. We have a mission to do. We have a mission to the poor and the struggling and the needy. Those two pastors on CNN reminded us all of that. We are called to do something about what's happening in the world. We are a school of love. That's what the church is. And as a school of love, we're not here to survive. Survival is not an option. The option is really doing the will of Jesus Christ, getting out there, being busy, and doing what needs to be done to alleviate the suffering of the world. There are too many churches who've cut out programs, programs that were benefiting their communities, programs of feeding the hungry, offering what they could, offering space for those who have no home, offering all kinds of things to help out. And they've given up because the money isn't there. And the money isn't there because they want to make sure their buildings are all looked after and the future is there for them. But in a sense, that's the other way around of what it should be. We only need buildings if we're doing the will of Jesus Christ. We only need buildings if we're going to be doing what needs to be done for the poor and the suffering and the needy. This year, we're going to be doing all kinds of things to help out people, I hope. This year, as Trinity here in Barrie has moved beyond simply survival, we are beginning to look at things like the faith works that we need to do to share what we have with others, to do what we need to do to make life better for other people.
And we should always be reminded of Archbishop William Temple. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the beginning of World War II. He said something very, very profound. He said, the church does not exist for those who are members. The church is the only organization that exists for those who are not members. It's the only organization that exists for those who aren't members. People like um, Ellis Peters, when she wrote those mysteries, <clears throat> reminded us of that. That in the Middle Ages, we provided what was necessary for people. Hospitals, healings, libraries, universities. We were always in mission. We were always outreaching. We were the people who sent missionaries to China, to Africa, not with a flag, but to heal and to help and to carry a word of God that was meant to be healing and loving and nurturing. Those missionaries, if they were doing their best, weren't trying to force people into anything. They were trying to reach out to people who had a need. And that was the best of who we were, the best of who we can be. And now our mission feels here at home. We need to be washing the feet of other people. We need to be showing people that they are loved, that they are needed. It's a horrible thing to think of so many thousands of people who are dying throughout this pandemic. We can't even open our churches. We can't even open up and give a space for people to be in and share in and pray from. Prayer without action is also something that is not very useful. We have to pray for all of those people who are caught up in this pandemic across the world. But we also have to act. Our faith works make a difference. And those things that bring us to mission are important. Because if we are doing Christ's mission, we don't have to worry about surviving. We will thrive and we will grow. And young people who are not coming to church will say, see what those people are doing. See how they're helping. See how they're making a difference in the world. Because Jesus Christ has called us to wash the feet of others, to be in mission. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Collect for the Day. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has taught us that we do for the least of your children, we do also for him. Give us the will to serve others, as he was the servant of all, who gave up his life and died for us, but lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to comfort us. In all of our afflictions, be with us, to defend us from error, to lead us into all truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that the peoples of this earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Almighty Savior, at midday you called your servant St. Paul to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Fill this world with the radiance of your glory, that all nations may come to worship you, for you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us when you come to your kingdom and teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Life is short. We do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and every day. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.